I'm really humbled to be here uh, and be the strong lecturer this year. Special thanks to Pediatric Cardiology, uh, the Department of Pediatrics, and Dr. Strong for this invitation. And first and foremost, this lecture, I believe, is an opportunity to reflect on Dr. Strong, his remarkable career, uh, the foundation he paved for all of us to follow, and the tremendous impact he had in the community and beyond. Understanding the past is critical for us to move forward. Besides being a master clinician and, and leader, Bill is known for people like us in the younger generation for his seminal work in preventive cardiology and pre-participation athletic screening. And he has contributed greatly to exercise hemodynamics in various disease states, in pressure loading conditions, volume loading conditions, in sickle cell disease in collaboration with the Sickle Cell Center, which opened up here in the early 70s. And he had also a big role in developing guidelines for cardiovascular health promotion in childhood, medical education at every level. And all of these had tremendous impact in bringing us to 2019. This is a picture of Bill from uh, the early 70s. And this was when Bill invited Dr. Norm Talner, who is seen in this picture, as a visiting professor at MCG in the early 70s. And you can see Bill with the people who worked with him at that time. And all these people have fond memories of Bill, and some of them especially remember his treehouse. I don't know if you still have it, Bill. <laughs> so it was a very popular place for people to go. And this is a 78 photograph. As you can see, there is an Indian delegation here led by Dr. Siam Rao at this event, and this was to celebrate the Charbonnet professorship of Bill in 78. And interestingly, in the early 80s, Bill had been flown to lecture or be a visiting professor in 44 states and in 15 countries. Can you believe that? And Bill was affectionately called by his colleagues, not as the Charbonnet professor, but he was called the Delta professor. <laughs> okay. So some of them even considered uh, getting him a Delta airplane seat um, uh, as his office chair so that he would be more optimally comfortable and he'll be in familiar surroundings when he's in Augusta. He can see Bill in his uh, Delta office chair. So again, I'm so humbled, honored, and proud to deliver the Bill Strong lecture today on ultrasound-mediated cavitation responses for cardiovascular diagnosis and therapy. These are my disclosures. So my goals are to review some of the basic features of ultrasound enhancing agents, otherwise called ultrasound contrast agents or contrast microbubbles, then briefly go over some of the diagnostic applications and then focus on this new field of ultrasound theranostics in cardiac imaging. Most of us have heard of ultrasound contrast and understand that contrast is used for imaging, but many may be unfamiliar with the term ultrasound enhancing agents, and this is a new term that's preferred over ultrasound contrast. And contrast agents that are currently approved for humans are composed of encapsulated microbubbles. These are tiny bubbles that have an average size of 2 to 5 microns. So they're actually smaller than the size of erythrocytes. And stability of these bubbles is enhanced by the presence of high molecular weight gases within them. And the signal from microbubbles is produced in a unique fashion. Inside of an acoustic field, these bubbles can actually compress and expand as in this image. And it's this volumetric oscillation of the bubble that produces the ultrasound signal when we are imaging these bubbles. The microvascular behavior of these agents is essentially similar to that of erythrocytes, and that is the basis for their safety. So after we inject microbubbles intravenously, they go everywhere erythrocytes go, but they do not leave the vascular space. After an IV injection, they pass through the right side of the heart and then through the pulmonary microcirculation, they enter the systemic circulation. And this is unlike agitated saline contrast, uh, and it, which does not enter the systemic circulation. And these are some of the commercially produced agents which are uh, used around the world. In the United States, we have three. They go by the trade names Optison, Definity, and Lumason. And they, these agents differ primarily in their shells. For example, uh, Optison has an albumin shell, while Definity has a lipid shell. And all these agents are similar in terms of their size distribution. They are all 2 to 5 microns, but vary a little bit in their shell and gas composition. None of these agents are FDA approved for use in children. 
the only agent for cardiac imaging, I mean, the only agent that's approved for use in children is for liver imaging. So Lumason is approved for liver imaging, but not for cardiac imaging. Now, with regard to approved applications uh, in clinical medicine, we have one primary indication, and that is to pacify the left ventricle and better delineate endocardial borders or echocardiography in adults. So this is purely for adults. And what's the importance of LV opacification? If you do a better opacification of the left ventricle, it can have important clinical impact because it increases the number of interpretable segments uh, when you do echocardiography. And it allows for more accurate quantification of left ventricular ejection fraction and also regional wall motion. This can be particularly helpful in patients who are obese or patients with lung disease or patients who are mechanically ventilated. These agents also enable clinically useful enhancement of Doppler signals. For example, tricuspid regurgitation Dopplers, which we use routinely in echocardiography, they can be enhanced, as well as Doppler spectrum of many valve diseases. And then there are off-label applications, which we are going to talk today, that include myocardial perfusion, examination of a cardiac mass, and then the theranostic applications, which are mostly in the research setting. So how to use an agent in a echolapse? I know that there are uh, many sonographers in this audience. So as in this example, this is definity. We uh, activate the agent by agitating it in a wild mix for about 45 seconds. And then you prepare a 3% solution and the nurse administers that while the cardiologist or sonographer is acquiring the images. And another technical point for sonographers, it's recommended that the ultrasound systems, the echo machines we use for imaging is set for low mechanical index imaging when using contrast. And why this is because it reduces microbial destruction and decreases the attenuation from the basal segments and basically enhances the myocardial opacification and endocardial border delineation. Let me show you an example of enhanced Doppler with using an agent. These are uh, patients with uh, tetralogy of fellow and transposition. And uh, we could not get a tricuspid regurgitation Doppler on echocardiography. And you give a little bit of contrast, and you can see that the continuous wave PR Doppler is enhanced with using the contrast. Contrary to common perception, older children can be technically challenging to image using standard transthoracic echo. And patients with congenital heart disease pose additional challenges due to caustic window limitations. They have had previous cardiac surgery, chest wall issues, and several alterations in cardiac geometry. And this is an obese patient. This is only a 14-year-old patient, but you pretty much cannot see anything on echocardiography. And unfortunately, we get these kind of pictures in echo labs. And this is another um, adolescent where you see the non-enhanced images. You cannot see the left ventricle that much. You give a little bit of contrast, you can see that the left ventricular endocardial borders are well delineated. You can see all segments very well. Uh, you can also see the right ventricle. So here is the left ventricle, you can see the borders very well. You can see the right ventricular borders very well. So you can see the difference between the non-enhanced and contrast-enhanced images. And this is quite helpful in clinical stress echocardiography as well. This is uh, an example of a patient who had stress echo for chest pain. This is an adult patient. And you can see you cannot you cannot really appreciate the basal segments at all. And this is, again, rest uh, ultrasound contrast. And you can see the left ventricular wall motion very well. You can see some of the right ventricle very well. And this is during stress echo. All these segments could be nicely visualized with very low mechanical index contrast imaging. And this is so important for a critical patient like this who presents with chest pain. Though most of the work is done for the left ventricle, using ultrasound enhancement can help for assessing the right ventricle as well. Uh, also in patients with difficult windows, this is one of our patients who, who had tetralogy of fellow repair. These are non-enhanced images. Um, again, the quality of imaging is much better with use of a little contrast, where you see improved visualization of the right ventricle, including the anterior wall as well as the apical segments with administration of a little contrast. Now, contrast is also helpful for identification and characterization of intracardiac masses. So this is, again, very low mechanical index imaging. And this can be helpful for differentiating a thrombus within the heart from a tumor like a mexoma or a metastatic tumor. So, And how we do that is by um, using some perfusion using contrast. 
And this is a, a right, this is a thrombus that does not exhibit any kind of perfusion to it. And this is a, a right atrial myxoma, where again, you see some perfusion to that mass. And this is a tumor metastasis in the right ventricle, which has the perfusion equivalent of, a, of the myocardium. So these kind of ultrasound perfusion techniques can be applied uh, to differentiate intracardiac masses and to better characterize them. All this is good, but wait, is the use of these agents um, safe for children? And uh, this is a snapshot of the safety data, the large body of literature that's available uh, in the last uh, 10, 12 years. And it emphasizes the volume of safety that's available uh, in adults. In the last 10 years alone, there is published data on ultrasound contrast safety from multiple studies ranging from 5,000 to 80,000 administrations. And all these studies add up to over 260,000 patients. And importantly, there were no deaths and severe reactions occurred in less than one in 10,000 cases. We published the largest pediatric experience from Nebraska a few years ago. And using these agents over several years in uh, 140 patients less than age 21, uh, these were for various indications for congenital heart disease, acquired heart disease, evaluation of chest pain. We used this for LVO pacification and also for stress echo. And there were only 11 instances of minor symptoms, and all these symptoms were transient, and all our patients completed their protocols. A word about perfusion imaging with contrast, which is a key off-label application. And perfusion is a technique to detect microbubble presence within the myocardial microcirculation and to quantify the myocardial blood flow at the capillary level. So this is quite helpful, um, not only really for a suspected coronary stenosis problem, um, but it can also be helpful, uh, for example, in congenital heart conditions like a Kawasaki disease child who has a coronary problem and coming in for assessment of coronaries later, or a patient with arterial switch or uh, anomalous aortic origin of coronaries repaired. So any coronary manipulation as a child, as they come back later, perfusion imaging could be quite helpful. Perfusion can also be helpful to evaluate a supply-demand mismatch situation, which occurs in many of our patients. For example, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, any form of cardiomyopathies, aortic valve disease, where there is no epicardial coronary stenosis per se, but there is usually a supply-demand situation. So how do we do this? This is an example of a stress perfusion echo in a 17-year-old. This patient had congenital aortic valve stenosis and had a valve repair with root replacement. And two months later, the patient presented with chest pain after, after surgery. And he had an exercise, regular exercise stress test, and that had shown ST segment changes. So he was sent to us for a stress perfusion echo. And these are images that are acquired at rest, which you see on the top panel. And these are images at rest. So what we are trying to do is we are assessing the reduction in myocardial blood flow because any reduction in the myocardial blood flow prolongs the replenishment time of microbubbles within the myocardium. So that's the concept of perfusion. And we are trying to assess this replenishment of microbubbles in the myocardium at peak stress under very low mechanical index imaging and with application of intermittent high MI pulses. So what you're looking for and what you see here is this dark areas of perfusion defect, which essentially is delayed replenishment of microbubbles in the myocardium which you see in N systole. And this is the same patient with images in real time that shows delayed replenishment, which is manifesting as extensive perfusion defects. So this is the wall of the left ventricle and all these dark areas of perfusion defects um, in the mid and the distal septum, as well as in the lateral wall. Uh, all these segments have uh, these dark perfusion defects, which indicates that there is a left coronary artery issue. And this patient was taken for surgery and the intraoperative transesophageal echocardiography showed that the, there was redundant aortic valve leaflet tissue from the previous surgery that was closing the ostium of the left coronary artery and causing the chest pain symptoms. Now, the next, the couple of things I wanted to talk about is purely an adult cardiology topic because uh, contrast is more extensively used in adults uh, compared to children. And I wanted to touch upon microvascular dysfunction, which is a, an important mechanism that lead to myocardial ischemia. So up to 40% of patients who undergo coronary angio, uh, when they come to the ER or when they come to the cath lab for evaluation of chest pain, they do not have coronary problem. Their coronaries appear normal, but what they have are microvascular abnormalities. And this is because uh, the capillaries in the myocardium play a major role 
in regulating coronary blood flow during hyperemic stress in the presence or absence of significant epicardial coronary stenosis. So it's optimal to look at myocardial blood flow and which could be used almost anonymously with capillary blood volume because 90% of myocardial blood volume is contained in the capillaries. So myocardial blood flow assessment with contrast perfusion technique, which I showed earlier, is more sensitive uh, compared to the available non-invasive techniques like CT perfusion or SPECT for detecting coronary stenosis and for predicting outcomes. So this is an example of a clinical situation where uh, this patient had inducible perfusion defect, uh, a 50-year-old man, and he had a, um, a wall motion abnormalities as well as and systolic changes of perfusion, which are these dark areas as shown here. And this was due to a 60% stenosis of the right coronary artery, which you've seen here. But the traditional method, the FFR, uh, was showing only 0.94. So in our experience, there are a sizable number of patients with normal FFR, fractional flow reserve, who have abnormal uh, echo perfusion and wall motion, indicating that in those patients, the capillary blood flow at peak stress is reduced. And we looked at this, we compared the cardiovascular event rates in patients who exhibited this type of inducible microvascular perfusion abnormalities during stress um, in the presence or absence of obstructive coronary artery disease. We looked at uh, 380 consecutive patients report for coronary angio after a stress perfusion echo. And we grouped them into three groups, uh, patients who had a microvascular abnormality uh, on stress echo, um, and a negative coronary angio, that was the positive negative group. Those who had both positive, a stress perfusion positive and coronary angio positive. And the third group, those who had both negative. And when we compared the event rates, we compared the survival examining the death and non-fatal MI in these patients. Uh, those patients who had inducible myocardial blood flow abnormalities uh, as evidenced by positive stress perfusion echo, in the absence of significant coronary artery disease, this is the positive negative group that is shown in red here. And they still had similar event rates as those with significant disease uh, shown in green. So these patients who had a negative cath and positive stress echo, their event rates are pretty similar to those who had both positive. So uh, the point of the study is that uh, stress echo perfusion improves the detection of microvascular perfusion, microvascular dysfunction during demand stress and identifies a high-risk patient group that should be followed closely irrespective of their coronary angiography. Coming to uh, the safety and the usage of contrast, uh, who should not receive an ultrasound-enhancing agent in 2019? The only contraindication for use of contrast is an allergy to the agent or to blood products for the optisone agent. And remember, the optisone agent is composed of albumin shells, uh, intracardiac shunts, or pulmonary hypertension, or any other cardiac conditions are no longer contraindications. And right to left uh, shunt contraindication was there before, but now it has been removed. And, uh, but it has been recommended that further safety studies are needed in patients with large right to left shunts. For example, if you use contrast in a patient, in a repaired congenital heart disease patient with a Fontan circulation or some complex disease with significant right to left shunt, the safety of those uh, uh, conditions are, are not proven, but for regular congenital heart diseases or um, any adult conditions without significant right to left shunt, uh, it's safe to use contrast. So what's the next in clinical uh, pediatric imaging? To summarize the key points, the use of these agents in children appears safe. Uh, however, there is no safety data published in contrast in children less than five years of age. And we need more interest and enthusiasm on part of the ECHO community uh, to participate in uh, more trials in pediatrics. There is a new trial uh, which GE ultrasound is starting and Augusta is part of that trial. Uh, so we should do more and more. And uh, they should be used in patients uh, if you have inadequate Doppler signals or if you cannot have good right or left ventricular analysis with standard imaging. Uh, co contrary to common perception, older children and Young adults can be quite difficult uh, to image with standard uh, transthoracic echo. And there are several instances where perfusion imaging could be helpful. We talked about the microvascular abnormalities um, in coronary artery disease, but other, other microvascular problems in aortic valve disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, or arterial switch or systemic right ventricle, or in all these conditions, perfusion imaging could be helpful. Low mechanical index imaging for the sonographers 
should be used to optimally enhance these images. And labs that routinely use them should have a policy in place for emergent resuscitation in case uh, some rare problem occurs. And for any uh, echocardiography lab or, or cardiology program to, um, to develop a contrast program, it's recommended that uh, they should perform at least 50 supervised studies in the presence of a trained echocardiologist who is experienced in these applications. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about the next part of the talk, uh, which is the exciting new world of ultrasound theranostics. Theranostics is a hybrid creature like the Centaur, uh, which is a new field of medicine which combines specific targeted therapy with targeted diagnostic testing. So with this diagnostic power, and therapeutic efficacy, the potential for theranostic applications is broad. The example of theranostics which we worked on is by combining ultrasound and contrast. So that's what we are going to talk about next. Ultrasound theranostics is already uh, starting its inroads into clinical medicine. And this is an overview of the emerging techniques. And this includes sonothrombolysis, molecular imaging, um, uh, targeted drug and gene delivery, and several other uh, uh, targeted ultrasound theranostics applications. And my goal is to briefly talk about the applications that are really relevant only to cardiology or pediatrics. A therapeutic ultrasound can be broadly divided into two types. The first type is called high intensity focused ultrasound, where you use ultrasound energy and you deliver the ultrasound at very high energies, something like 4.2 megapascals or greater. So this is uh, a high intensity ultrasound. And remember diagnostic imaging, when we, when we do a standard echocardiogram, the megapascal is one to 1.1. So this is pretty high. But what we are going to talk about is a surface ultrasound based low intensity ultrasound. So that, what's, what, what we use clinically uh, in echocardiography and how that can be modified and how that can be combined with adjuvant microbubbles uh, for many of these applications. Microbubbles can be targeted to epitopes. So this is about the molecular imaging part of it. Uh, and these epitopes can be expressed on endothelial cells and thrombi. And, and what they do is they incorporate ligands onto their surface. And these targeted bubbles have applications as molecular imaging contrast agents for drug and gene delivery. And people have studied multiple targets in the in vivo setting and in vitro setting, including the myocardium, uh, peripheral artery disease, as well as pancreatic islets and tumors. Now, let's look at an example where a modified diagnostic ultrasound, this is the ultrasound transducers we use for echo imaging in our labs, can be used for a therapeutic application. So this group used albumin-coated microbubbles to effectively deliver a gene, which is the beta-galactosidase gene, into the rat myocardium um, using um, ultrasound. So this is a, a short-axis section of the rat heart that shows galactosidase stain uh, galactose days expressed four days uh, after the gene delivery was made. This indicates that the gene is expressed. And this is a section from the control rat that shows no galactose day staining. So this type of targeting mechanism with diagnostic ultrasound and microbubbles have been applied for the treatment of diabetes, where people have delivered genes into the pancreatic islets in animal models. So this is a rat model. They used an insulin-specific promoter to drive expression of a gene called the neuro-D gene, which is shown here. And after the gene was delivered, there was regeneration of pancreatic islets in the diabetic rats with the normalization of the blood glucose levels as well as the insulin and C-peptide levels. The same group then extended this application to the pancreatic islets of a non-human primate model, and, uh, which was the baboon. And the baboons which, which, which were treated uh, received a cocktail of genes composed of three genes. And this gene therapy with ultrasound and contrast microbubbles um, was effective in regenerating the beta cells, achieved normalization of glucose and uh, improvement of plasma glucose, insulin, and C-peptide levels. And this is an example for how diagnostic, again, this is diagnostic ultrasound, not of high frequency, not of high energy, what we use in our echo labs um, and microbubbles were used for therapeutic angiogenesis. This is a 1.3 megahertz diagnostic ultrasound transducer that was used for a targeted vascular endothelial growth factor VEGF delivery. So they compared two types of de delivery of VEGF in the ischemic muscle 
uh, a direct intramuscular delivery and an ultrasound microbubble mediated delivery. And these are immunofluorescent stains comparing the two methods. And this ultrasound mediated delivery resulted in a more homogeneous distribution of VEGF in the ischemic muscle, uh, indicating that there is more efficient angiogenesis with this technique. Others have performed therapeutic angiogenesis with microRNA delivery for limb ischemia. These are contrast and non-contrast enhanced perfusion images after microRNA delivery that shows high microvascular blood flow in the ischemic hind limb of a rat model. And uh, this is uh, the uh, vasculature of the microRNA delivered muscle that shows there is increased vascular density and improved tissue perfusion after this mRNA delivery. In the next few minutes, I want to prove to you that the diagnostic ultrasound transducers, again, what we use in our echo labs, have the potential for uh, therapeutic applications if we modify them um, in a minor fashion. So when we infuse microbubbles and we image at a very low mechanical index, so you can't get the microbubbles and ultrasound in, in contact, uh, this is the type of response we elicit from the microbubble, and this is called the linear oscillation of the bubble. And as we change that power, as we change that mechanical index to a little bit higher, then that oscillation changes from linear to nonlinear. And this is when the, there is an asymmetric contraction and dilatation phase of the bubble, and this causes the bubble to generate some degree of shear stress. And as we go up on the MI, we get this phenomenon called inertial cavitation, okay? So with inertial cavitation, we, what we see is fragmentation of the bubble and generation of much more energy from the bubble uh, that can cause significantly greater degrees of shear stress. So if this inertial cavitation phenomenon happens near a vessel wall, it can change the endothelial function or endothelial permeability. And if this happens near a thrombus, for example, then it could alter the permeability of the thrombus to a lytic agent. So these are the types of microbubble cavitation responses we are trying to achieve with our theranostic applications. We are limiting our achievements if we become satisfied and stop questioning. A culture of curiosity is as important in medical research as it is in theoretical physics. Albert Einstein said the important thing is not to stop questioning and curiosity has its own reason for existing. So now let me tell you the story of how uh, my curiosity in theranostics was sparked. 13 years ago, I was fascinated when I was uh, an assistant professor junior attending in Nebraska uh, with the work of Dr. Tom Porter, who is shown in this picture. And Tom was using a combination of ultrasound and microbubble uh, theranostics for breaking thrombi in a couple of settings. One was acute MI, and second was stroke. So he, he had animal models of MI and stroke, big models in which he created thrombus and he was using ultrasound microbubble cavitation therapy, which I showed using the same principles to break them. So as a pediatric echo uh, doc and a pediatric cardiologist, I wondered whether this could be used for um, situations in which we need to lyse thromba in our infants and children. And Philips Ultrasound was interested to work with us. And, and that was the beginning of our journey in which we successfully utilized this technique for several targeted applications for reducing central venous catheter thrombi um, for keeping arteriovenous shunts open, and more recently for targeted nitric oxide release and reversal of vasospasm following peripheral artery injury. All of us know that vascular obstruction uh, is such a pervasive uh, medical problem, and central venous catheters uh, are associated with thrombi. We have uh, central venous catheter associated thrombi in our intensive care units, in our neonates, in our cardiac patients, in our hemong patients. So wherever we have an indwelling catheter, after a few days or weeks, you get thrombi there. So the principle of, uh, um, of the mechanical effect of cavitation for uh, sonothrombolysis is shown here. This is a schematic with thrombus within a vessel that causes vascular occlusion. And you administer microbubbles, and they flow through slowly, and then they accumulate in the thrombus here. And then at this time, ultrasound is supplied and ultrasound cavitates the microbubbles within this slow flowing tissue and over a period of time, eventually dis dis uh, dissolving the thrombus and restoring the flow. We tested this in vitro in a canine arteriovenous shunt model uh, and this was where it was first tested 
And we are using diagnostic energy ultrasound here, which you are seeing as vertical lines applied here. And low mechanical index imaging is continued to guide when to apply those high mechanical index impulses. And early on, despite angiographic occlusion, uh, you can see that there are small channels within the thrombus uh, on low MI imaging. And you wait for those channels to replenish and then you apply the high MI impulses. And over time, by repeatedly doing this, you can see what happens to those channels. They get bigger, they merge, and eventually they dissolve the whole thrombus within the graft over a period of 20 to 30 minutes. This is another example of how we studied the mechanical effects of inertial cavitation on the thrombus. Uh, this is again an in vitro study with a, um, a high speed photography of the thrombus while we are applying intermittent ultrasound impulses. So initially the ultrasound is turned off and then uh, you are waiting for the bubbles to replenish the thrombus and then the ultrasound is applied. So you can see that every time the ultrasound energy is applied, turned back on and off, the thrombus is getting a little smaller. So this is a microvascular disruption phenomenon. Eventually this mechanical process continues and with this mechanical process, the thrombus is sheared away and eroded away without any need for lytic therapy. And we are doing this with the standard diagnostic ultrasound transducers, which we use in our echo labs. This technique was uh, studied. Uh, this is one of our early studies. Uh, we created an animal model of central venous thrombus. So this is a central venous catheter. We put in the SVC of a pig, and this is a thrombus that is at the tip of the catheter. And we, uh, we put an intracardiac echo transducer by the side of the thrombus. And then while, while, while we are delivering the treatment, we were continuously capturing the images. So you can see the microbubbles flowing there, the ultrasound energy is being applied. And after six cycles of treatment, you can see that the tip of the catheter is completely clean uh, and devoid of thrombus. This is a larger thrombus, which is almost completely occluding the, the catheter tip. And this is again, after five to six cycles of therapy, the thrombus is completely dissolved and sheared away from the tip of the catheter. This is an example of uh, uh, how we use this technique for um, keeping arteriovenous shunts open. So uh, just like Pushpa was talking, Blalock toxic shunts and other types of shunts are commonly used in uh, cardiology and cardiac surgery. Uh, so this is a carotid to jugular shunt, which we placed in an animal model. And we were trying to thromboprophylax it, so to prevent thrombus accumulation within the thrombus. And we used randomized weekly ultrasound microbubble treatments in animal models uh, compared into three groups over six weeks. And um, the groups which received the treatment was compared with the groups that re received no treatment. And this is uh, the echo image while the treatment is going on. This is the echo image while contrast is going on. And this is an example of a shunt that was expanded and that shows reduced thrombus burden in a treated shunt, whereas this uh, untreated shunt is fully occluded with thrombus. The last application I wanted to talk about is muscle perfusion. And this is uh, work from the group in uh, Portland uh, in OHSU. This is led by Jonathan Lindner and colleagues. And they have shown that you can have increased muscle perfusion with ultrasound mediated microbubble cavitation. And this is mediated through releases of nitric oxide and ATP. And this is a mouse model in which they have shown that uh, uh, there was increased release of ATP with this therapy that could reverse limb ischemia in mice. And also they tried this in sickle cell patients who presented with acute um, limb pain. They used ultrasound microbubble cavitation therapy uh, in the emergency room setting. And these are contrast enhanced images from the forearm of a patient who had sickle cell disease, which illustrates an increase in the muscle perfusion, increasing with the time of cavitation exposure. So we borrowed this technology and we investigated if the similar theranostic applications could be used to treat peripheral artery injury. For example, femoral artery injury uh, after a cardiac catheterization procedure. So many of our infants who go for cardiac catheterization interventions, they get big catheters and sheets in their groin and they lose their femoral pulse and um, they may require heparin. They have uh, vascular, long-term vascular issues. They may need TPA. So this vascular injury is quite common, uh, especially in small infants who have tiny vessels when they go for procedures. So we created a model of femoral artery injury, which you see here, you can see the femoral artery and femoral vein in cross section. This is a downstream popliteal pulse. So this is again an animal model. And uh, um, this is 
soon after we had two needle, string, st needle stick punctures and the vessel goes into acute spasm, the, the popliteal pulse downstream is blunted, and then we immediately started microbial cavitation therapy. And this is uh, five minutes of treatment. You can see that the pulse is reappearing faster compared to a control animal. And this is an example of an angiogram. So this is soon after injury, the vessel goes into acute spasm all along. And then this is five minutes into treatment. Uh, you can see that the caliber of the femoral artery is improved. Um, the Doppler and uh, angio data showed significant improvement. So this is a schematic of the, of the experiment. Uh, this was published a couple of years ago. Um, and this is the vessel being injured, going into spasm. This is our treatment. You're visualizing it live using ultrasound, and uh, this is uh, post-treatment, and this is the Doppler and uh, the angiographic data following treat treatment. Now, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, we now know that much of clinical disease is micro microvascular, and um, it is not suitable for conventional therapy. So much of clinical coronary disease, so when you take them for angiogram, the coronaries appear clean, but it's usually microvascular disease and acute chest pain syndromes. So uh, the greatest teacher failure is, so let's consider therapeutic ultrasound and see if therapeutic ultrasound would work. And this is the first human randomized trial on ultrasound-guided cavitation of microbubbles. So it's already in the clinical setting, okay? So this is a study. It's a purely adult study. So they use diagnostic ultrasound and microbubbles to treat acute MI in the, in, when the patient comes to the ER before going to the cath lab. Okay, so this is the first results in acute STEMI. And in patients who underwent primary percutaneous coronary intervention, um, they found that the epicardial recanalization rates are much greater in patients who, achieved, who received this therapy. And moreover, there was improved microvascular perfusion and significantly improved LV ejection fraction one month after treatment. And this is the next result. This was published in, uh, in uh, Journal of American College of Cardiology uh, three months ago. This is the uh, the second study, um, which is again a prospective randomized trial into ultrasound microbubble cavitation treatment before and following emergent PCI in the cath lab. And they, they compared this with the control group that received only the cath intervention. And sonothrombolysis with ultrasound microbubbles improved the recanalization rates and reduced the uh, infarct size and resulting in sustained improvements in systolic function three months after acute STEMI. Now, this is an example of the patient from that trial. Uh, this is a patient who had a pre-PCI ultrasound microbubble treatment in the ER before he went to the cath lab. So you can see the ST segments are elevated here, and this is post-treatment ST segments. And um, what we are assessing is this during treatment, the microvascular function <laughs> is improving, and uh, the patient already had patent coronaries by the time he reached the cath lab. The lady had a further stent, and, and this is a post-treatment angiogram. So um, I hope our discussion has demonstrated to you the great diagnostic and theranostic potential of ultrasound combined with microbubbles that unfolded before your eyes. But where do we go from here? So uh, the next phase of our research in this area will focus on how to better optimize the ultrasound and microbubble settings for each of these applications I talked about, acute MI, the pediatric applications, vascular applications. So we still have a long way to go we need to still study the most optimal pulse duration and peak negative pressure on ultrasound. We need to do some more technical steps so that we can optimize this and take this in the clinical setting. While we focused on research on uh, diagnostic and theranostics in the last 30 minutes, we recognized that with the legend, uh, Dr. Bill Strong, the broader mission of an academic department to achieve excellence. So Bill has shown in his career that a strong and effective research mission is an important way to enhance the value of a department, a hospital, and a university. And he did this by promoting a culture that values research, curiosity, and collaboration. And he encouraged collegiality in the hallways, knowing that sometimes a cool idea may arise from a collegial hallway conversation. And what if we tried this? What if we tried something different? And of course, resiliency, persistence, and protected time are important. Uh, he provided the mentorship, the sponsorship, and leadership. Uh, for example, his Building Bridges Initiative and co-founding of GPI. All these are examples of uh, his mentorship, sponsorship, and leadership. 
And he mentored young faculty and fellows to excel, and they went on to have glorious careers on their own. So Bill was like a farmer. He tilled the land, planted the seeds, watered them, and then fertilized them, and turning the seedling into a full-size plant. There are many seedlings that emerged out of that. This is Bruce Alpert, and you can see him uh, in his green jacket here. And uh, many of them, I heard that 11 of 13 faculty who Bill recruited went on to become division chiefs. And most importantly, Bill reminds us of our service to others, our dedication to make others' lives better, all with kindness, compassion, and human understanding. I wanted to acknowledge and thank Dr. Tom Porter because all the work that I showed is what he taught me, and uh, all the slides, most of them are his. And I also wanted to acknowledge uh, our grant support from the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, uh, NIH, and Philips Ultrasound. And also I wanted to introduce our new uh, research initiatives in, in Hopkins. So this is something called Cardiovascular Analytic Intelligence Initiative, or CVAI squared. Uh, this is a new research program which we are launching at Hopkins. Um, and these are the people. This is Cedric, uh, who is the director, and then Bharat, Vivek, and Fuad. And this initiative is for uh, focusing on developing the infrastructure for integration of predictive algorithms uh, in complex systems and studying their clinical implementation and utilization. So I'll talk about that research when I come to Augusta the next time. Thank you again for your uh, attention, and uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. I'll be happy to take any questions.